Today it is my very great pleasure to speak to my friend Michael Shaw. Michael and I came to Finthorn at the same time in 1974. Uh, unlike myself, Michael has spent the balance of his career out with the Foundation, working primarily in the United States, but also elsewhere. And today we want to talk to him about that life and that work. Do you experience your work here as being not an action? Uh, what I mainly spend my life doing is working with technology. And to be honest, I love the technology. Uh, so, uh, and the technology is in the world of action, it does things. So it's in two fields, water and energy. So the water systems we build are natural water systems. They're very beautiful. They're completely aligned to the philosophy of rock. And that, you know, rock, Rar Ogilvy Crombie, one of the founders of the community. And, um, you know, I just feel good about these systems. Um, Who's we in this case? A company called Biometrix Water that is part of the, one of the many organizations that are based in the collective here. And they also work with energy, and, and again, it's mainly the work, the grant work we've got now is mainly around renewable energy. In my fact, it's only around renewable energy. And that's something I think uh, the whole world uh, loves, and we need to love if we're going to survive. If we don't love renewable energy, we're in deep trouble. Uh, but it's, it's great. It's, a, it's a walking lightly on the planet, doing more with less, doing a lot with very little. Is the, is the great benefit uh, to our society and civilization of renewable energy. Can you foresee a time when we will live in a sustainable world? <laughs> well, I work a lot with um, Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, and the professor there is called Professor Owens, and he says sustainability is impossible uh, for a, a Western civilization. And I can hear what he says. As you, it's a little bit the laws of diminishing returns. We've got a long way to go until we get the laws of diminishing returns. Uh, we've got a lot more to do in energy and water and the built environment and everything else. Uh, but, you know, whether you're ever going to be totally sustainable within the life cycle of the planet uh, is questionable. And what's the, what's, what's the constraint? Why is it impossible? Well, right now, our ecological footprint as Scotland um, is still a twice what it needs to be uh, if we're going to be in a sustainable situation. And, and half of that is actually um, things we can do very little about. The military, the health service, the transport system, the government, and all that type of thing. It's not as if we can control that. We can only control half of it. So even if we control that half to zero, uh, we'd still not be quite sustainable, if you know what I mean. So we'd have to have a very different sort of civilization in order to be totally sustainable. I think we can get there, uh, but uh, it's not, as I say, the, the closer you get to it, the more difficult it becomes. Because, you know, we still have to transport ourselves around although we can use a lot more electronics now. We still have to have some energy to drink tea, although we're getting more and more efficient in doing that. Actually, you mean to our computers. Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so we can get there, but you know, whether we can be, whether we can be technically totally sustainable, I don't know. But it's, it's splitting hair to some extent. We're on that road and we need to stick to it. What do you understand by the term totally sustainable? What would that mean? We're, we're within the life cycles of the planet as it exists today. So in other words, we're not running the system down in order to survive. You know, as you know, we're taking out a million years of fossil fuels. It took a million years to put down the fossil fuels we take out in one year. That is not sustainable. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're cutting down the rainforest uh, at, 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 a, at an increasing rate. Uh, and, you know, if we carry on doing that, we're going to have no rainforest, and the rainforest is responsible for a lot of the oxygen you and I are breathing right now. So, again, that's an unsustainable activity. Um, and a lot of our military, you know, and, and the wars and the, all that stuff, it's not a... We're a very unsustainable civilization. 
and you need to be radically different, radically, radically different in order to be, uh, to be on a path that has a long-term future. Well, as you know, um, a year ago, the nations of the world came to this agreement in Paris to take steps to uh, mitigate uh, climate change and global warming. Um, I presume that the function, the, the, the goal there is simply to uh, arrest the, the, uh, the warming process so that the planet continues to function pretty much as it has during our lifetimes, in fact, during the lifetimes of our civilization in the West. Yes. I mean, can you foresee the human race surviving for another thousand years? The main thing we have to do, in my, in my view, and I think what Michael Linfield said last night, we have to move from I to we. We are a very I generation, you know, my planet, my car, my house, my friends, my whatever. And until we go from I to we, which is a lot of what this community was founded on, um, then that will mean that we care as much about the carbon being emissioned uh, by you know, palm oil mills in Indonesia as we do about the north of Scotland hydroelectric system. Uh, you know, we are, it's a relatively small planet uh, now, and a, uh, it, we've, got, we've all got to move from I to we, and it's one of the principles Michael was talking about. If our principle is, does this really stack up to a, a planet that's about we, as opposed to just I, then that's a very good guiding uh, principle, and that's what we have to do if we're going to be here in a thousand years. And the, the Paris Agreement is a wonderful example of moving from I to E. I think, this is only my own personal view, my, my own personal view is we should increase our efforts of what we really can do. What I can do something about is lowering the carbon in our community here, um, is lowering the carbon in India, where we're working with uh, our sister community, Oroville, which has a significant potential of because of their great interest in solar energy and the link to the universities in Scotland here that control that, that can make a big difference. So that's something that we can do. Uh, so I'd like us, I would like us to, at the same time, having this big picture of, of moving from I to we, within that we've got our own responsibilities that we have to see to, something we can actually do as about by our little nation, and we should do that. What disturbs me more is the decisions about Hinkley Point, uh, nuclear power station. It's, it's about the third runway at Heathrow. Uh, it's about all sorts of uh, projects that seem to be going exactly in the wrong direction. Not the smallest, beautiful, high to we direction, but the sort of me first, let's build some really big infrastructure projects so that we can make some money type of stuff. It's very short term, very, very short term. So assuming we take a longer term perspective and appreciate that most of what we can do is basically where we live mm -hmm. or in response to some initiatives that we want to support in the larger world, what else, is, what else do we really need to do? What, what else can we do? I mean, do you think that meditating and praying together or have any significant impact? You're talking about what could we could do here as a foundation. Yeah. Um, I think what we can do is, as is, is you know, to the best of our ability, um, in our own lives, incorporate all the principles, the beneficial principles we believe in. And I think we believe in a spiritual life. To me, a spiritual life is about understanding your true nature and working from that true nature. And to the extent we can do that, I think we'll be living up to our aspiration of being a spiritual community. I think uh, we can, we can uh, adopt uh, a, a, you know, a, a policy of being as um, alive ourselves to our bioregion, which is an area we really can have an impact on, and work with that on everything from food growing to, you know, no pollution to etc. Um, etc. Et uh, so I, 
I think we can we can really sharpen our focus there a bit. And as such, if we can possibly pioneer some new angles, so much the better. We always have been pioneers of some new angles. So let's keep going and find some new angles to pioneer it. Michael, why did you accept our invitation to become a Fintuan Fellow? A good question. Uh, I've always a, uh, felt that the fellowship uh, was an important aspect of our corporate life, our larger life, as it were, and to have these links all over the world with people who care about the Foundation, have been here on a number of occasions and can contribute in the form of intellectual input, uh, in advice, in that type of thing, has really been very helpful to our, our life together. So presumably, you, your, your perspective on Fintorn Fellows is that they were welcome visitors from time to time. What would they add to the equation, do you think? Well, I think what they, I think what they have added is, um, you know, supporting us with a particular impulse, you know, whether it is our um, look at, at the, um, renewable energy or our aspiration to be, to be a more carbon efficient, as it were, um, where, you know, our association with Centre of Technology and, and some of the other people in the States who have done good work on this thing has been helpful. Um, I think also just, just giving us a sort of certain big picture approach of our role um, within, a, um, within the emerging culture, as it were. I mean, last night we had a great lecture uh, in, the, in the community centre by a fellow who was here a long time ago and has really was able to, to, to feed in this larger place of what building a new world looks like. You have spent um, much of your working life abroad, or at least out with Scotland, your native Scotland, one of the very few native Scots we have around here these days. But um, what would that work entail? Uh, basically, I, I was um, you know, trained as an engineer. I went to the University of Glasgow and the University of Strathclyde, which is also in Glasgow. Um, then joined a fairly large UK um, construction company, actually the largest UK construction company. Uh, and so I worked a lot overseas for that company. That was my main responsibility um, in the Gulf, in Africa, Caribbean, the Far East, that sort of thing. Um, so that was the start of my career. And a, after then I came to Finhorn from there. Uh, and after that, I returned to London, because London's where our family ho home has been for 40 years, uh, and worked as um, a strategy consultant a, uh, with a small company uh, in the city. Uh, and from there, I uh, moved to the United States uh, and worked uh, mainly in New England, in Vermont, um, with uh, Dr. John Todd, who was a the, the sort of inventor and founder of um, a, a, a particular aspect of what we call ecological engineering, that is engineering uh, useful projects, as it were, but the main players that do the work are natural players, our bacteria, zooplankton, protozoa, fish, snails, uh, plants, etc., etc., etc. So it was, it's a growing field. He was a great pioneer for that, and I worked with him mainly on his research and development corporation, which was a Massachusetts corporation. Well, both John and Nancy Todd, as you probably realize, are fellows, in fact, yes. important fellows, yeah. So That's it's right. great that you could have that kind of collaboration. Yeah. I was introduced to them, actually, initially by Vance Martin, who's another fellow <laughs> right. you know, of wild fame. Wild fame, yes. And wild in this case means what? Well, it's the Wilderness um, Leadership, a uh, uh, um, sort of organization that he's run from the days he left Finthorn. So it suggests that we're something of an incestuous family or whatever. <laughs> I think that is true. I think that is true. Actually, when we, we formed a, a, a commercial company to commercialize the technology, the ec ecological engineering technology in the States, and the founders, 
there were four founders, and only one of them was not an ex-member of the Finhorn Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> so we kept it within the family, uh, which was very good because we'd worked together. We'd all worked together here, uh, and then we worked together there. And um, it was a very useful um, collaborative exercise. And we sort of knew how to get on with one another. So it was a very pleasant and inspiring group of people to set off in a new path. So it's really important to work with like-minded, isn't it? Well, it's also not necessarily like... I mean, it's good to be challenged as well, mm. but if you're starting something which is difficult enough, like forming a new company and a new technology in a new place, uh, it's good to, good to uh, have not everything open to the entire um, aspects of the universe, but to have you know, a certain closeness uh, in the team. When did you come back and what brought you back? We had formed, uh, we, we had um, sort of initiated with, with friends a co-housing community in the States, which is still going and is, 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 was an interesting uh, escapade in, uh, in Vermont. But uh, the, the community was about housing uh, and it wasn't so much about <laughs> everything else. You know what I mean? So it was, a, it was a very good community as far as housing was concerned. But it was a, a little bit, the lawns were a little bit too green. Uh, the, the housing was a little bit too perfect. Uh, there was no ethnic or cultural diversity at all. Um, very typical of Vermont. Uh, it was lovely, but I, I just felt, that, I think both of us felt we needed a little bit more uh, of a community that actually had, a, had a more of a mission. And that wasn't just about housing. And do you feel that the members of your co-housing community here at Findor, or um, what do they add to the equation that didn't exist in, in your Vermont? Well, the main thing is they're part of a larger community. I mean, this is, this little community here is largely about you know the, the, the social co-housing community is about co-housing, um, but that is our that's only very you know a, a relatively. It's important, but it's a minor part of how we spend our lives. I mean, most of us are spending our lives within the larger community or working with other organizations within the larger community. I mainly work with Finhorn Foundation College, for example. And, um, you know, and, and uh, this is quite a diverse little community, but the great thing is it's within the Finhorn Foundation total community. So that makes a lot of sense. Michael Shaw, thank you very much. Thank you.